Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Friday at 6 talk show. Today, we're broadcasting from the startup office here, not really a startup office, the Dutch embassy, but supporting startups. We're live from Berlin. So, on my left side here, Jess Erickson, our first guest tonight. She is CEO of the Gigets. She is leaning in as her own boss, trying to make like the coolest organization for female entrepreneurs working in tech in the world. So again, here the live audience, please give it up for Jess Erickson. <laughs> Next to her is a, a person who lives, thinks, Globally, always on a plane, always complaining about which time zone am I in now, working in the marketing business and doing an awesome job now at one of the finest companies here in Berlin, namely Linko. Give it up for Olga Steidel. <clears throat> and next to Olga is Stefan. And if Stefan is not on a last minute plane to New York, he is spending his time in Brandenburg, Really, he comes from Brandenburg, the province around Berlin. It really exists. It's beautiful there. Also a little bit quiet, but um, then he's spending his time in Brandenburg. So he's actually living in two very different worlds. But when he's in Berlin, he's working on Sofa Tutor. Give it up for Stefan Bayer. So my first question, of course, is Jess, uh, what is Gigets all about? I mean, why do you want to make such a fuss out of it? Are you sure about that? Are there a lot of women working in the tech industry? I think not. And it's, it's an unfortunate situation we're in. I think, in short, Geekettes, if you don't know about us already, is an organization that's trying to close the gender gap in tech. I think in this room tonight, there's probably about 25% women. I want to bring that up to 50%, maybe 75% someday. And what we offer is um, a series of things, mentorship, workshops that accelerate them into different areas they want to dive into. It can be everything from iOS development to negotiation strategies. And then we also create a series of events that really gives women a voice and a platform to showcase what they're building, creating, designing. And, um, you know, we've just launched globally now, so we're all over the world, and including Maastricht in the Netherlands. Wow. Yeah, and um, it, it's been an extremely amazing learning curve for me in the last, especially last eight months, understanding the gender side of things as well as the tech industry and the challenges. Mm. But I do believe that there is a paradigm shift and things are changing and women are seeing the potential of growing into the tech industry and um, hopefully really claiming those leadership roles. So I'm optimistic, and I'd like to thank everyone who supported us along the way. So lots to talk about uh, in this coming half hour, maybe, yeah. maybe a little bit longer. Um, Olga, are you a giget? Are you also totally convinced of the fact that there should be this special kind of organization for women in tech? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, I definitely agree that there are some patterns in female behavior which need to be changed. We discussed it with... with um, just like uh, five minutes ago. Um, but on the other hand, I really don't like to be in a room with women only, because I think to learn business, you need to be with a man. Like everything I learn, I learn from a man. How to um, set up a company, how to create a business. No, really like, um, I really think that putting people, like putting female in a room with only female doesn't teach them how to work in a tech company. But I need to interject here. There are always men involved, always. If yeah. they are an API coach at our All Women's Hackathon, if they're teaching a workshop in UX design, men have been pivotal in our growth. Okay, but, but is Olga then, like, is, is she an exception that she only learned from a man? Is yeah, it, is it a, a general it, rule? It varies from individual to individual. Not everyone might be as confident as Olga. Mm. Not everyone can step yeah. up and get on stage mm. and speak before an mm. entire yeah. uh, group of individuals that she doesn't know. We are trying to train and embrace the fact that women have this potential. They yeah. just need help and support. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Stefan, uh, <laughs> I see. What the hell am I now in what kind of discussion? We even, Is he going we even to... We address the problem. <laughs> <laughs> like, color matching. 
So I'm not going to ask you if you are a giget, but I mean, I want to short, I mean, what, what's the ratio in your company? How many women do you have? And maybe you could also explain all the people here what Sofar Tutor does. I think we have more than 50% women, but uh, that might be due to the fact that we are working in education and that education is traditionally a bit more female than male. If you look at the teachers in schools, it's more female teachers most of the time. Mm -hmm. So we do education, we help students to succeed in school by offering uh, an online platform called sofatutor.com. We um, offer educational videos for students from first grade to 12th grade in English, mathematics, sciences, and other languages. So you can practically learn everything on SofaTutor that you would learn in school, from grammar to mathematics to physics. And uh, so you come to the website, you watch videos. After the videos, there are interactive tests that let you practice what you've just learned. And in case you get stuck on your homework or you need to prepare for a test and you need to talk to someone, there's a chat with teachers popping up mm. below the websites and you can ask any question you have and mm. get an answer within three minutes. Yeah. So that's so, the product that we do. So, and um, concerning the ratio of females, mm. uh, female and, uh, and male, um, I think the marketing team is very mixed. Um, so that would be, I think, a bit tech techy already as well. Um, the tech team itself is very male, male dominated, yeah. mm. uh, I must say. But the editorial part, the teaching part is, is yeah. mostly female dominated, yeah. I would say. So, so, I mean, the main question during every Friday at 6 always is, why do you want to do something for yourself? So why do you want to have your own company, mm -hmm. you know, take all the risk, uh, you know, against all odds in lots, lots of the time, you know, you work on a problem that nobody thinks uh, 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 is, really exists. What, what, what in your personal si situation was the case? Why did you want to start your own business? Um, I think I, um, for me it was very natural because I started uh, founding NGOs and businesses when I was 17 already. We did an international NGO for youth work when we were 17. And, raised a lot of government funds to do international youth exchanges and I had a soup stand on medieval markets in Germany one time and one time we also sold um, um, photos taken of houses from the sky because yeah. we had a parachute. And but there a was a need, there the was back. a need, a need inside of you that, that <coughs> made sure that this happened. I think it's um, proactivity that wants to get out and uh, also a, a problem with authority. You okay. don't want to be told. <laughs> Check. <laughs> uh, that's, that's some parts. Maybe there's a bit of egocentrism as well. Um, you think you are cool. You think you can do stuff. Uh, I don't know if that's so bad all the time. That's mm. a, but that's a bit but of the very, psychological It's very mechanism. un-German. It's very un-German. <laughs> no? Not true? Okay. Some people are booing. That has never happened before. Also very un-German. No, but I mean, it's true, right? In this... <laughs> In this very in this very German town, um, I mean, didn't people look look strangers? I mean, you can you could go to university, which I think you also did, but you dropped out. So again, a sign of I want to do things my own way. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say that uh, there was a lot of uh, support when I started doing it in the first place, except um, that's the kind of crowd that we have here. I mean, that whole startup ecosystem is very very much a lot of socio emotional support comes from the group that sits here I think so mm -hmm. uh, that kind of drives you to do stuff and take the risk um, mm -hmm. but um, yeah creating value for someone else and um, is not really my thing I, I really like to work my ass mm -hmm. but also uh, get the benefits out of that okay Olga you're uh, you're from Russia right correct yeah and when, when did you came to Berlin um, to Berlin or outside of Russia? There are two different things. Well, to Berlin, to, to Germany. Um, yeah. It was last summer. Last summer, okay. What are your experiences so far here when, you know, the, the, especially the topic of, you know, the German mentality and starting your own business? Um, I think to understand German mentality and starting your own business, you need to get out of Berlin. Um, in Berlin, definitely, like, if you look at our team, we're 13 entrepreneurs from everywhere outside of Germany. We have me only as a German speaking um, person in the team. Um, um, German mentality about taking risk, sometimes really, you know, we don't want to share data or um, we can't take the risk or um, how our neighbors will look at us. Um, can I get bankrupt? Yes, of course you can. Um, 
but it's still Berlin is not a German city, and that's what you need to remember when you're here. Mm -hmm. But because what's the other part of Germany like then? Very conservative? Very conservative, uh, for sure. Um, on the other hand, the positive thing about Germany mm -hmm. is that German people know how to grow businesses to the point of profitability, mm -hmm. and actually they bring money. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're not that fancy, and maybe not that sexy businesses, mm -hmm. but these businesses work. Yeah, but isn't the point that um, in modern times, in internet times, if you really want to scale, go for this global leadership, then looking at profitability too soon can also be a very big danger, for example, if you want to go, you know, if you want to internationalize. Yes, for sure, and it's, only, um, it's not only about profitability, right? Um, I, I'm doing growth at Linko, so we're looking at uh, numbers, how we can attract much more like sales managers to the platform, and then the question is where to start growing. And in many cases, even for a German country, um, growth is not starting in Germany. Maybe your product is not for this market, and then you need to adjust your mindset, and then, for example, go for more risky business yeah. when you don't get profit right away. Um, but that fits for your market and fits. But for this your is this is really weird. So you are working from Germany, in right. Berlin, and actually this is only a pla this is only a workplace for you guys. Your market is maybe somewhere else. Um, Germany is quite a big market, but it's not the first market for sure because first, as all developers, we start building our apps in English. And then we need to adjust it for German market. Mm -hmm. um, for sure, Berlin right now is a great place for us to be in terms of um, hiring and HR. Mm -hmm. And um, living is amazing here, right? Yeah. So yeah. we enjoy it. Yeah. So Jess, you started out, and this is actually also, you know, we met, uh, I think, in September 2011. You were back then still at Zex Wunderkinder. You did uh, marketing for them, PR. Um, of course, a company that now in, in Berlin everybody knows because you know they, they, they got funding from Sequoia, 60 million, I believe. And, uh, but they also went through very difficult times, of course. So, I mean, you're quite seasoned in that regard. Um, I must add, you were not at Zex Wunderkinder when they went through these hard times. You were already gone by then. But um, now, in Berlin still, after the, all these years, what, what do you think of Berlin, you know, in terms of the startup scene, dealing with... German mentality, uh, but also the scene growing as such, also learning from each other more, sharing the resources, sources, as you said, back then in 2011 already. Well, I mean, it's hard to define and be a culturalist uh, because I haven't been here long enough to make a really strong assessment, I guess. But I'd say overall, uh, Berlin is a special place, regardless if it's in Germany or not. Um, I all a great deal of gratitude to all the amazing individuals that have helped me achieve my goals. I think this is an open community that's about supporting one another and hoping that everyone succeeds. And we realize it is a collective success. You want to be stronger and faster and build and, and attract people from all over the world to come and join your company mm -hmm. as well as your tech hub. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just been an amazing ride. I've yeah. been here for three years now, and I can tell you, uh, I never thought in a million years that I would start a global organization and headquarter it in Berlin. But all of the opportunities and all the externalities and the individuals I've met have allowed me to get to where I am. And I'm not really so sure I could have done that in London or New York or Seoul or wherever I lived in the past. I think there's a unique recipe and there's a DNA in this city that allows people to go after something big. And regardless of the risk, they do it. And, and nine times out of 10, I think they succeed. Mm -hmm. um, they might not be completely successful in a sense that they had a big exit or an IPO or you know, made billions of dollars overnight. I think, I mean success in a sense that they've discovered themselves, they've taken a challenge and they've built something from nothing, and that is an incredible thing, and that's something you can never take away from an individual. Yeah, but this 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 social kind of um, helping each other out, it's not really something that you build a business upon, right? I mean, you still need a very good idea. Of course, you still need funding. You need to attract like the best people out there that are not always willing to come to Berlin. So, I mean, sure. isn't this isn't this like the the socially acceptable story that I think in in essence is also true? But I've heard so many times that there are the downsides in Berlin, if you really actually want to build this global product, are way bigger than the, than the advantages. Well, I mean, going back to the beginning of your comment, um, I think building business comes down to relationships. 
I think it's the relationships you build with the people that you trust and build a company with, to the investors that you meet down the road, to the big corporate companies that you're reliant upon to expand your supply chain and expand your products. And I feel that it takes time, and to put pressure on Berlin, because it is still very young in that sense, it, it, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. But I feel like we're on a trajectory that's at a very fast pace, and I feel that give it five or more ten years, the journalists out there are going to stop downsizing us and saying that we're nothing, because we are something. But just give it time. Be patient. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't want to, you know, uh, I don't see myself as a journalist who is downsizing the community. No, no, I'm, I'm referring to a different journalist. <laughs> no, I, I, that no, I've, yeah, I know, but I think you know what, some, what, what some, some German uh, journalists do very well is they're actually also, you know, pinning it down to the fact of, okay, but what are now revenues actually, and what are the exits that we have seen? And maybe then going to Stefan with such a low, long experience, season experience in the startup scene as well. I mean, do you, I mean, we're over the, the blah blah marketing, of course, because, you know, we've seen some, we've seen some uh, uh, bankruptcies, but we've also seen a couple of exits. So we're, we're to the next phase, right? So what is now the next phase for Berlin, in your opinion? I'm, I'm really not sure if I'm the right one to ask. I mean, my experience is quite limited because I have a very German-centered product. We sell German education, uh, and we we probably have a product that's quite difficult to internationalize. Still, for the past year, I've been thinking about internationalizing almost every day. That was like my thing: mm -hmm. make a plan on how to internationalize Sofa Tutor, and um, we're going to get there. But I believe the market window is quite large, um, and I think there's different uh, scenes. Uh, when I started Sofa Tutor, we were had the idea in 2007, and in 2008 we founded the company. There was still a very German-speaking startup scene here that changed a lot, and there's different cliques now and different people uh, hanging around. Um, but for what's the next stage? I mean, it would be great to see people having their headquarters here and just opening up small sales offices here and there and having the geekettes here, a big like community-oriented service worldwide that creates formats of exchange and formats of getting together and uh, doing stuff here and transports them to other countries. It's awesome. I mean, that's an invention uh, being well, made in Berlin and then exported. Shutterstock is yeah. headquartered mm -hmm. here. They could have picked London. They could have picked Tel Aviv. Who else? But yeah. what did they do? They chose Berlin. Yes, yeah, so they're European headquarters, right? Yeah. 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 And, but for the mobile service, this is the headquarter. For their mobile part, this is the headquarter, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's a good sign. Shutterstock is a company that we have to watch. Yeah. yeah. So Olga, um, I mean, you work at a company uh, actually, you know, that for some people will be very hard to understand the product because it's actually a B2B uh, uh, product, right? right? So B2B also something in Berlin, of course, that is not uh, not so obvious all the time because yeah. when we think of apps, it's also because we had some workshops here before at this location. And you also started your introduction with, you know. We can all relate to apps. We all, you know, how to, we think that we all know how to market a photo app, which is of course not true, but B2B is a whole different ball game. So what is it at Linko, you know, how do you go about that? So this B2B part of selling your product, explaining it to other companies. Um, there is, there are like two parts of, um, of the answer. Like the first part is, it is about my personality as well. So I studied actually what I do. Um, I studied ERP systems and CRM systems. So the first job was at the factory in Gilead in St. Petersburg installing ERP system. Since then, I hate enterprise software, you know. And um, it's easier than to relate to the product you are actually really patient about. Mm -hmm. Like, and um, on the other hand, I understand when you say it's really hard to explain what we do to a person who has never done sales, for oh. example or to a person who um, is not a techie. Though we do a product for non-techie people. We do a product for people who have no time to type in their information. Mm -hmm. They have no time to read manuals. They have no time to do anything. We need to explain through the product and we need to explain through their experience what they're getting um, and what kind of a value they're getting. Mm -hmm. um, this is really hard. Like tailoring the message is definitely really, really hard in that case. So show us how. Explain Linko to all of us. So yeah, so basically, you're all techies, so I can use uh, such words as CRM and uh, data as a service, right? Yeah, but I, I'm not a techie, so please okay, explain so it for me. Yeah. I talked the other day to a girl who is a stylist, and she asked me, so what do you do? And I said, imagine you have clients, 
and you call your clients, you send your clients emails, and you want to close your deals. So what we do, we aggregate four types of information. We aggregate your calls, we aggregate your emails, we aggregate your documents, and your calendar appointments. And for example, you have a team member, a second person who uh, works on the same project with you, for example, a photographer, and he sells the same type of service to the same type of people. So you want to share this information to you. So that's what I think, we do. I think this is a little bit the long version. Isn't it a little bit more shorter possible? Yeah, Let's so we collect the data and yes. give you reports. So what? We collect this data and give you reports back. Ah, okay, okay. So then you're in the next phase. And then it's interesting because you were talking about opening sales offices here of big companies. I mean, selling. You know, how, how, do you see, who, how do you do selling in tech? Please introduce. That can be a little bit longer. How I personally do yes. selling in tech? Yes. I'm a girl. Like, it's easier. But, um, oh, okay. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but um, no, um, definitely it's um, hard to talk to people, like especially to corporate people, it's really hard not to be arrogant and not to be, oh, I know it all. You know, we, we come here, we spend less money than you. Um, definitely listening and understanding what their need is and not pushing your product right away. Um, but then knowing people and creating connections between people. So maybe I have a lunch with you, you won't bring me value tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow we figure out that we have um, a common connection in this client I'm actually really interested mm. in. So all about building, building this social network inside mm. your own head, yeah. to whom yeah. to go, yeah. and also support. Mm. I, like a lot of uh, our close better users are actually from the support team, and mm. I call it the support team. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I mean, it's too nice to let it go. I mean, you used Bring it on. the phrase like, yeah, because I'm a girl, and of course, I mean, you're beautiful and all, and I mean, you know, I'm not going to lie about it, but isn't this exactly... <laughs> oh, this is, now I'm a sexist, yes, of course. So, so, but yes, isn't this exactly, isn't this exactly what you, what you think of is, is, is not the right way to go in explaining I, stuff like, as, as a women in tech? Answer this no, 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 let's just first give you some rebuttal and then... You Why are you go. putting me between you two? Okay. Um. <laughs> well, you're from the Gigettes. Yeah. Your, your aim is it to have women being valued upon, you know, their what they know I'm about, valued. about, That's about not their the brain, point. not about their looks. Well, I think Olga, what she meant to say was that it it's an advantage to be a woman in some situations. Absolutely, okay. it's an advantage to enter a conference, uh, you know, in Germany and then show up and be one out of ten women. You're more likely to get get around and meet people because you look and sound different and you're probably creating something different. So certainly I think we... There this women this in remark our... wasn't a problem at all. This no, remark. well, I, I mean, eventually, of course, I'd like it to be a point where it's completely equal and the gender is no longer an issue and I never have to continue to build geekettes ever again. I mean, okay. that is the end goal, right? Okay. But right now, it, yes, we do tend to sometimes diminish ourselves, and that's not what Olga's doing, but I see it being done by many women. Mm -hmm. Women do hold themselves back. There is know. another point which I meant, like, mm -hmm. um, women understand people better and feel pain better. When I sit across the table from a man, I can understand right now how he feels, what he's thinking about, and oh what is, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not exactly what I meant, and you know that. But, um, oh, okay. This is, it's, yeah. about, it's about understanding a need as well. Like, mm -hmm. um, and maybe, you know, you come into a room mm -hmm. um, for a business conversation. You approach the same person every time differently. And for women, it's much easier because they understand this mm -hmm. um, shades of gray. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the gets, uh, you were inspired by Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook, right? Or is that not only your source of inspiration? No, no. There's so many other women okay, that okay. are a source of because inspiration. She, okay, but she, she wrote Lean In. So, and, and, and she actually said, okay, you know, women have to, you know, get this leadership's position and have to step forward and have to take their advantages. Yeah. Um, wh why don't you think this, why do you think this is not happening enough? Well, I, I mean, I think there is a shift right now that's happening. I mean, if you read the news like I do and you consume everything, um, there's certainly an agenda to push for female mm -hmm. um, leadership and equality in not just the tech industry, but industries worldwide, right? And what I think Sheryl Sandberg has done very well 
is created a conversation in the public sphere, right? We, we talk about things all the time behind closed doors, but it took her in the unique position that she was in to leverage that and create a real conversation. Now, whether you like it or not, I mean, I'm, there's a lot of people that don't agree with her approach, and I've read the book a couple times, and um, there's not, I don't agree with every single tactic and strategy because I feel like women are leaning in within the structure. I, I, I'm sorry, but, but yeah. I mean, I, I ask, what, what is now the problem why women don't step up? I think it's cultural. I think there's a lack of role models that allow women to visualize and see that their careers can be in leadership roles. Yeah. If we had more, mm -hmm. sh imagine there's 2,000 Sheryl Sandbergs in Berlin. It'd be a completely different scenario. Mm -hmm. But because you can't see it, you don't believe it, and you don't okay. become it. Yeah. So now, I mean, Deutsche Telekom is a sponsor of Kikets, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. And you know also what the situation at Deutsche Telekom is regarding women, right? How yeah. many people there are women in female in the board and in directors. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty bad situation, right? There are I wouldn't not call that many. It, I wouldn't call it a bad situation. I would say it's a situation that needs to be improved. Of course. Now, they have an internal quota, and they're public about this. They want 30% women mm. In roles at telecom, they're actively trying to change the ratio, and I've met very few companies in Germany that are trying to do the same. Yes. And whether it's a good approach or a bad, at least it's an effort yeah. to try to create change. Yes. So by them partnering with Geekettes, mm. they have insights as to why this is important mm. and and how to strategize and why it's important to have women project leading like um, Olga is and why women bring in diversity and innovation and approach to design and building. They because see the value in this and that's the first step. Because first step. what is exactly the value then? What is the value of diversity? What is the value of bringing in more women into leadership positions? Um, because, you know, maybe telecom so far has done also, you know, they're in a very bad shape, of course, nowadays. Mm -hmm. But they've always, you know, made their money. They're a huge corporation all over the world. So, you mm -hmm. know, they will get by also without women, right? They'll get by, but maybe they're missing out on innovation that doesn't exist today because there are women that are not innovating in a space, right? If you imagine and you think about it, the industry we have is predominantly run by young men, well-educated, white, maybe somewhat middle-class affluent, right? They have the ability to step up and start a company. And when you have one demographic that's always the same, it's hard to mix things up and create innovation that's appealing to women and, and different ethnicities, right? How is a 20-year-old man sitting in Berlin who just got out of college understanding what a 45-year-old woman in uh, Nairobi wants? What digital solution does she need in her life? They wouldn't be able to come up with that, but maybe a woman would make that trip halfway there and get to that point. Mm. So what I'm saying is diversity equals innovation. The more perspectives and the more people we get involved, we're going to see so much that we never knew could exist. Mm. And this is why I'm pushing this every day. So Stefan, do you think that uh, Sofa Tutor as an as a education technology company is doing better because there are more women in the company? Mm. I never look at it like this. I mean, it's, it's a topic that either goes deep with you or not. Uh, also, I think um, it's strongly connected to what you've experienced in your own life, in your own family. I've, I, I got very um, equal parents. They both had their careers. And, and, and so that, that was never like a personal topic that I thought a lot. For me, it's always about the best person for the job, but um, on the same time, I understand these quota discussions uh, because I, I grew up in, uh, in the eastern part of Germany. Um, there was a lot of quota stuff going on in the old GDR, you know. <laughs> my parents, uh, my, my mother, she was a, a farmer's child and my father was a worker's uh, child and they both went to university uh, for the first time in, in their family's uh, history, you know, that was all um, part of a big quota kind of policy mm -hmm. run by the state. So in a way, uh, sometimes that does good stuff and mm -hmm. obviously it's not equal, equally distributed. Mm -hmm. Women are not working that much in leading positions and in tech and that might be an, a mentality problem and a, a problem of risk profile, personal risk profile, so why not, why not uh, do stuff about it? I think people arguing against it are probably just scared of too much competition and that's yeah. you know let's let's, to worry about. Let, let's zoom a little bit more uh, uh, into your space the education space because of course it's a super interesting you know environment education is changing you see the massive online 
courses evolving in, Ger uh, in, uh, in the States, but now also a little bit uh, in, in Germany. So how has your product uh, offering these videos of, of, of extra lessons for, for, for scholars, uh, for students, sorry. H how did your product evolve over, over the years? Because um, in technology, you know, it changes every day. You have new features, new possibilities. So how, how have you kept this, this, uh, also this, this, this strength within so, so far Tutor? Yeah, you, you started talking about the hype in Berlin, and now you said it again, education is a hype. Um, probably that education theme is the only hype that we do. The rest is very conservative publishing business sometimes. Uh, uh, we had some hype uh, things going on. We did a lot of social learning in the beginning. We had study groups that you could uh, create and you can... You could study with your friends. We killed that. We killed all the social features at some point. Study with your friends is not working. It's not working. Okay. No. You just want to like, <laughs> you, you, get you, you more or less could have known, right, before you started. Or <laughs> it, was, it was quite a horrible lesson. We wasted probably two years of our lifetime on the whole social thing. And another thing was that we thought uh, we'll just uh, provide the platform and people will crowdsource, uh, we'll crowdsource the content. So we thought there's lots of explaining talents out there and they will do the videos in their little base cam, base, basements and uh, uh, hobby rooms and create awesome videos, but that never worked out. So the whole crowd uh, sourcing hype, also we killed it, we threw it away. Now we have studios and we have people doing that full time and it's so much better quality. So in a way we became that publishing house, disruptive publishing house, I call it today. Yeah? Um, not, so, not so much hype uh, involved in, in a way, but uh, yeah. it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So, so how did you learn over this period of time? Um, by going boldly into one direction and uh, giving yourself a deadline and see if it works or not. Yeah? And then being uh, brave enough again to turn it around, even though you've probably wasted a lot of money and a lot of time. Yeah? There was a few times when we saw things picking up, so there was lots of optimism involved in the beginning. Uh, but it's always easy to create a lighthouse project, you know. It's always easy to have a few early adopters, but then it plateaus and you see months passing and you don't crack those nuts, you don't see it picking up again. Uh, mm. um, those times, we had them for a few times. Yeah. So, and uh, uh, is the founding team that started Sofa Tutor, Sofa Tutor still there? Because they, they, they must have been hard times with all these shifts, I mean, analyzing, investing, seeing that it doesn't work out. Yeah, we, we were two guys starting it in the beginning, um, and Andreas, the, the guy I started it with, he, he left, but I wouldn't say it was because it didn't work out on, okay. the, on, the, on the growth uh, um, topic. It was more because he wanted to do something different in his life, which is, which mm. is understandable and okay. Yeah. Mm. But uh, yeah, of course, you lose people on the way, not only in the founding team, but also in other areas. Um, I think it was really, what was the most hardest thing was that we understood at some point that there was, there's no, for us at least, there's no silver bullet. We were always, in the beginning, we were always trying to find that one channel, that one idea that will solve so many problems, make it viral, make it, whatever, grow organically via Google or, or YouTube or whatever. and. Uh, it took me years to understand that it's a lot of nuts and bolts and you need to incrementally in, uh, improve the product mm. to make it grow mm. over a longer time of period. Mm. You recognize this Olga, where have, having worked in, in a couple of startups. Is this the way how you should go about it? Um, it's really hard to say this is the way, this is not the way before you went for the way. Mm. Um, and even if you face the same problem once again, like I had the same issue with, um, we have a co-founder and then something happens and then like twice. Mm -hmm. And both times um, it's a completely different situation. So how you deal with that? You have more experience definitely from the <laughs> past. Um, am I allowed to say fuck up? Yeah, um, from the first fuck up. Um, but um, you are always in a new role, in a new position, in a new person. Mm. Yeah, I asked this question uh, during the last show, you know, is a founder somebody who has this talent within him or her that is just has always been there or can you learn how to deal with this kind of situation? I think there are two things you really need to look at. First thing, um, do you trust this person? And how deep is your trust? Um, I might say, yes, I trusted my co-founder, but my trust was not that deep. 
Like I can, um, now with the CEO of Linko, I can basically tell him like really fuck off. Like right now you're doing something completely irresponsible. Um, and he understands that and he comes back and says thank you. Um, the second thing is about um, abilities to learn and abilities to listen. Um, is this person ready to learn as fast as I'm learning? Is this person is ready to grow as fast as I am learning? Because for me personally, it's my personal issue. I start being really itchy when a person next to me moves slower than I do. Um, and then I feel uncomfortable about that. So for me personally, I really need to see that the progress we're making is our common progress. And it's not only me pushing it. Hmm. Uh, Jess, you, you're working together um, with Denise. You found it to gets together. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't, you, how did you met her? Because I mean, this is also, of course, you know, you have this great idea for a product. You think you're going to conquer the world. And, but I mean, you cannot do a startup alone, right? right? So you always have to find other people. Mm -hmm. how, how did this go, go between you and Denise? So um, yeah, it was funny. We were sitting at a Rails girls workshop. We were both learning how to program to learn basic Ruby on Rails. How many of you have taken Ruby on Rails? Okay. You should. If you're interested in computer programming, it's yeah. a great introductory by the, course. By, okay. By the way, <laughs> what is General Assembly nowadays doing in Berlin? Oh, wow. Okay. Talk about putting me on the spot, Dirk. God, he's good. Um, so Denise and I met at Rails Girls, and then soon enough, I brought her into General Assembly. General Assembly teaches classes in web design and entrepreneurship and um, computer programming. And the two of us had a great time running GA, building up classes and workshops. But we both noticed that there was a lack of women in these workshops. And at the end, that became sort of the more important agenda. We, we appreciate and love to build educational programs, but we see that there is even a stronger need mm. to get women in first. And then the second step is getting everyone to the next level. Um, I'm, I can't comment on what GA's future plans are. As far as I know, they're knocking it out of the park in the United States, which is great. And I hope to see more programs like GA sprout out all over Europe because the whole point of becoming a stronger and smarter ecosystem is the sharing of knowledge. Mm. And I feel that there are some programs here in Berlin that do that. So, you know, you can vet experts, they come in, they share the knowledge for a 45 minute to three hour workshop. But there needs to be more of that and it has to be more rapid. Okay. I mean, classes every day. Come on, let's soak it in. Back to Denise was more yes. interesting. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, my, my, my no, 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 no worries. Um, yeah, Denise is a great one. She's born and raised Berliner. Um, the two of us just clicked, probably because of the commonality. We're both half Korean, so we clicked oh, on that cool. level. Um, but then we also really appreciated the fact that um, we, we took the time to come to a Rails Girls workshop and then try to pursue and learn more in computer programming. Because I think in tech, even if you're a founder with non-technical skills, you should have a basic understanding of what your engineers are doing. That's going to make your team smarter. You're going to be able to communicate more effectively. I also think you need to have principles in design. Um, I, when working at GA, tried to soak in all of the classes. I'm not going to lie, I was selfish, and sometimes I built classes for myself, because I'm like, I really want to learn this skill. Oh, that guy's good. Bring him in. That girl's great. Let's yes, bring her in. Yes, you're doing great. So much revenue in Berlin. Oh, yeah. I, I see mean... this one name popping up all the time in these classes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I booked you should class. never stop learning, right? <laughs> I mean, until the point where you can't read or listen, you should continuously yeah. soak it in. It's going to yeah. make you a better founder. Yeah. It's going to make you a better engineer and a better designer. Yeah. But you never disagreed with her about how to, you know, how to shape the future of... Of, of gigets. Well, we've been pretty aligned with every step of the way. Of course, you have your disagreements. Are, are you the boss, or are you both sharing? Are you are you deciding where to go, or is she in that regard no, equal to? No, it takes two to tango. If you got two founders, you got to communicate. You got to figure out. Okay, are our missions aligned here, just as Olga described? Are we on the same path? Are we on the same page? Hmm. That's that's first and foremost the important part of building a company or an organization or an NGO. Yeah. The second part comes with, all right, do we expand globally, do we not? What are the repercussions? You need to talk those things through. Mm -hmm. um, we've certainly had our disagreements, that's healthy. 
-hmm. That's why you need a co-founder. Okay. I really think you need someone as a soundboard to test it. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you get in a Stockholm syndrome and you think, oh yeah, I've got the best idea. I'm going to go forth and do this. Mm -hmm. I've seen founders fail because they didn't talk mm -hmm. to their team. Yeah. They didn't talk to their co-founder. Is she, is she better at so certain things than you are? Of course. Yeah? What? She is a way better designer. She is so good with detail. I am the kind of chaotic person that's running around trying to meet people, build partnerships. I don't really have the attention span. I'm probably slightly ADD. Mm. I can't focus on these tiny, important details. These But are really important. But you don't really have important. a design product, right? No, but I mean, the look and the feel and the branding has to be good. Okay. That, that's half the battle, right? People have to gravitate and say, wow, this looks amazing. I want to be a part of it. Mm. You can't have a scrappy website that looks like blah. Well, I tried it a long in. time, so. You did a great yeah. job. I love okay. the logo. I okay. love the look and feel. <laughs> okay. This is, you're doing you. well, Dirk. You're doing well. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now you Every, put him on the spot. <laughs> so I hope the people did my visit my website a half year ago. We should start interviewing Dirk. <laughs> exactly. Let's interview Dirk. Okay, okay, okay. This is a good sign that we have to stop because you know if, if your interview guests are taking over, then it's uh, it's the wrong way to go. Uh, by the way, if there are questions over Twitter uh, using the hashtag F6 Show, uh, you can also. Uh, I, I see mostly whoop whoop Friday at six is back. Yeah, that's of course a very nice tweet, but uh, that's not really a question. Live from Berlin at Friday at six at the Dutch Embassy. Very good tweet. Very good tweet. Yes, uh, it's all correct. Friday at six is starting the live broadcast. Looking forward to the show. Okay, that's a little bit older. That's from half an hour ago. Uh, pleasure kicking off the new Friday at six show season. That's always nice, a compliment. But if there are some questions, F6 show, then this is the way to go. We have five more minutes before we, before we, uh, before we close. So you have to be fast if you want to tweet. And there are also a couple of people who want to say something here. Use the microphone to reach out to people here in the community. So in these last five minutes, um, Jess, what is something, because you're on, you're on, you, you travel all over the world, you're on all these panels, and then You know, I have like a very limited scope. Every individual has, in the end, a very limited scope because, you know, there's too, too less time to, to absorb everything. What is now always the question that is never being asked to you on all these panels about your, your deeper drive, about what you want to accomplish, about what it really makes a good startup, like ass kicking? What is the one thing that you always... No one asks me what do I envisage like the future of technology to be? And why, what do I want to see? So, do, Am I supposed to question. answer my own question? Yes. Okay. Way to put me on the spot, Derek. I think this industry is packed with highly skilled people. People who are inspirational, talented, equipped with skills. But what's missing for me, and this is just something, being in the industry for only four years, so I'm not someone that can reflect on two decades, I can say what's missing for me is social entrepreneurship and the feeling that people want to build digital tools that are going to actually improve our world in such a way that we can look back after 100 years and say, holy crap, we have made things better for human lives. I'm talking about finding technology solutions for poverty, technology solutions to stop human trafficking, to educate to empower the individuals that are living in this world right now. And I admire all the businesses that are being built and I admire all of the successes that have come out of Berlin and different tech hubs. And props and kudos to those people. But I also like to see people step up and build things that will impact them beyond just making a dollar and beyond just making a successful business. And I cannot wait to see what both men and women will build in the coming years. But that's certainly something that's at the top of my agenda and that I want to dive into someday. I want to make something meaningful. And I want to meet people who want to join me and I want to build something. So let's chat after the talk. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that answer, beautiful answer. So, Olga, what makes you to Olga? What, why are you Olga? What, what defines you? Because you've only arrived a couple of months ago, but already not. 
making a dent in the startup scene. People get to know you. People get to like you. What is your, what, 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 after a couple of years, how do you want to be remembered as Olga if you move on and? Um, I like people. This is like, I genuinely interested what they're doing, how they're doing, and why they're doing it. Um, and it's all about helping others as well. Because um, what I really like um, Jess' answer about Berlin and that's actually community, and that's why I call it support group. Because if you look at San Francisco, people sometimes are really shallow and um, they don't support each other. Here in Berlin, I get so much love and so much support from people, and um, I want to give it back. I want um, to help startup founders, like for example, here like Berlin Startup Academy founder and one of his um, girls I helped and we had an amazing dinner last week with her. And um, I just want to be remembered as a person who helped a couple of startup founders in Berlin go through the shitstorm, through a real shitstorm, because I know how it is. So Stefan, this is very hard now to get a, give a final quote after these two answers. But I mean, I know that you, I mean, you also have like very, very big ambitions, right? You also want to, you want to go after, you are going after actually a really big, big and large problem. So talking about this internationalization, for example, is Sofar Tutor actually going to step into other markets than Germany? Uh, what's your feeling about that right now? Yeah, we are definitely preparing to go to other languages. It's Which not, ones? Um, today I would say it's probably going to be Portuguese, uh, Spanish and English. Okay. But um, uh, since the world is still divided between people who can afford to pay something and people who can't, um, the idea to, to take the product we have or the, the concept, the idea we have to take that into both worlds and uh, enable people to learn um, that wouldn't be able to afford it, that don't have access to any kind of education mm. would be really cool. I mean, if you, if you think of people who are really smart, uh, how many are there in a, in a thousand? Maybe one person. Mm. And if you think of geniuses, <clears throat> how many are there? Maybe one in a million, like people who can really solve like big problems. Um, so if you look at countries where people have no access to, to, to any kind of education, will never make it to college, uh, there's, there's quite a few thousand geniuses that we are wasting right now that could probably solve some rocket science problems. Um, so sometimes I think that idea of um, showing videos and giving access to really good explanations that could be transformed to, to, to places like small African villages. I would, what I would really like to do, okay, now here's the detail, yeah? I would really like to buy 100 Land Rover Defenders, yeah? The car first, yeah? Lots of solar panels for each car, uh, laptops and uh, like satellite uh, internet dishes, yeah? And then uh, send out people, you know, like volunteers, like Teach for America, Teach, teach, uh, teach First, people who've uh, had a good education in a Western country, yeah? and tell them, hey, you're gonna go to, to a small village school for the next two years, and you're gonna watch educational videos with uh, these children there. Yeah. So if you have to understand uh, simple mathematics. You, you, you learned it in school, yeah? You don't understand, you, you can't explain it like by heart, just like by pressing a button. But if you would watch a video about the sign function with those kids, you could probably explain the sign function afterwards again and it, um, do some tests and, uh, and practices. Yeah. So um, to take that idea further and internationalize uh, and take the money from the one side of the world and mm. then also create a product for the other side, that would make those two worlds that we work in the social, educational part and the hardcore business part. I mean, we need to, we are 100 full-time employees and 200 people working freelance on a, on, a, on a very regular basis for us. We need to um, pay these people, you know, bring these two worlds together. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. Can I get a very, very big applause for my three guests tonight, please? <laughs> cool, 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 cool. So we're not done yet. We still have a couple of people who wanted to announce something. So um, a couple of people came up to me and said, hey, I want to announce something or, or I want to reach out. Now is the time to do so, if you still dare to do that. If you are scared, 
Yes, please. Grab a mic, mic from one of the guests, and please stand here in front of all of us and direct your message to the audience. There's the camera. There. No, no, sorry, there. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. I want to take this chance to announce the service that we provide to the Berlin startup industry companies. That there is a typical deadlock that startup companies feel that I have a great idea, but I cannot find the people that will make it for me. Or when I find these people, oh my god, I need four people and they cost so much that I can't really afford them. So then instead I forget my products and I go run around to investors and I go to the banks and then I go to the HR and I forget completely what I was supposed to do in the first place. So we solve this problem by assigning, or by giving you a chance to hire a dedicated team of programmers in an offshore location. But wait, offshore is difficult. <laughs> but so we change it a little bit. We give you a chance to select who will work for you there is a bridge in front one of you minute, in Berlin. One minute, shorter, wrap up. Okay, yep. and uh, you get to bring the people to Berlin once every two, three months. You get to go to the offshore location, work from there with them. So it's a remote team at offshore lower rates that you can easily afford as a startup. But still, it's a hybrid solution that comes to the same quality. And a person who sits in front of you every day who will help you manage it. So if you have this problem, come talk to me. OK, Thank but you. what's the name of the company and the website? The company <laughs> is called RoboRev, R-O-B-O-R-E-V. -E and the website is roborev.de. OK, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So anyone else or this? OK, so now we're going to drink Dutch beers. I want to. Sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, thank the Dutch Embassy for this wonderful location. And also thank the other sponsor, Old Swang, the law firm. A couple of people from Old Swang are here uh, tonight. Really awesome law firm that do amazing stuff with amazing people. So maybe you're also one of them. I want to thank them, my sponsors, and also the crew. Uh, Tim Optovic from StreamHub, who's doing an amazing job every show producing uh, this, this very high quality against a very low budget, I can assure you, uh, television show. Um, and also uh, Nora and Ulrike, who will produce some more video clips uh, later on. And everybody who I forgot, uh, lots of people working on Friday 6. I'm very happy that, that, that this is possible. So thank you all for watching. Here at the live location, we're going to drink something and going to eat uh, uh, pumice. So Dutch French fries, so we're going to have a, a splendid party here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're still a startup, right? We cannot afford. Okay, bye.